the cross. The cross means different things to different people. For some, it's just a lovely piece of jewelry that they may wear. Uh, to some, it is a representation of uh, their chosen religion. And under that broad heading of what that might be, it really doesn't say a lot of what they believe. It might identify what they don't believe, but it doesn't give a lot of definition. But it can represent religion, obviously. To some, it has always meant the emblem of death and suffering and agony. For, uh, for the Christian, for the one who is born again, which, by the way, that is what a Christian is, is one who has experienced the second birth. For that person, the cross is where the second person of the triune God died and paid for your sin. And you know that. But not only for the Christian sin. First John chapter 2, I think it's verse 2, says, uh, uh, even those who do not trust in Christ ultimately will spend an eternity in hell and go there with their sins paid for, but they didn't receive the free gift of eternal life that was theirs if they would only repent and believe in Christ. Just by way of reminder, the beautiful text in 1 John 2, verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. What happened on the cross where Jesus died is beyond our fullest comprehension. I, it's tough to do it justice, I have to admit. And I think only when the eternal state begins for the person born again will we start to realize and grasp the full significance of the cross. But what happened on the cross in the hours before Jesus died is also significant. Jesus engaged in ministry while suffering. Suffering through what is still believed to be the most cruel way to die. Invented out of the heart of wicked humanity. Folks, the death on a cross was not just a way to end a life. It was designed to suffer to the last. To preach on the cross is to preach on a topic that no one can truly do justice, but we still must try nonetheless, because the better we understand the cross and what occurred there 2,000 years ago, the reality of the cross will affect us 2,000 years later. For that one who is unaffected by the cross, I suggest he's ineffective for his Christ. If he's unaffected by the cross. Jesus ministered even while on the cross. And I'd like to look at that ministry there this morning. What that says about him and how that ministers to us even today. Let's pray and we'll dig in, shall we? Father, this morning, thank you for uh, the beauty of music that has caused our hearts to be lifted up this morning. But ultimately, thank you for the one that we sing about, that we read about, that we embrace, that we worship in spirit and in truth. So this morning, thank you for uh, the opportunity to enter in yet again to what took place on a cruel cross by design, by your design. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus' ministry on the cross, I'm going to give you three this morning. His ministry on the cross was a, 
a lonely ministry. Matthew 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Folks, the cruel, hard truth of that particular day is Jesus was abandoned. He was abandoned by his disciples, the very ones that he handpicked to be with him. And did they spend time with him? You bet they did. They spent some quality time with him. And yet they were nowhere to be found after the scene at the Garden of Gethsemane. When the text says they scattered, folks, they scattered. They did. The mock trials came, which eventually condemned him. And now he's on a cross, and they even took his garments off of him, casting lots, waging bets, personal bidding to have them. Abandoned by his disciples, uh, the passers-by who happened to see him up there, they looked at him and mocked in disgust, hurled words of contempt, and you remember from the text, huh, you save other people, save yourself. Very insulting, very condescending with a man hanging on the cross. But it wasn't just the commoner who passed by, even those of influence chose to mock him on that day. And if that wasn't bad enough, there were two thieves, one on either side of him, also mocking and hurling insults to him. But then the unthinkable happened. The one whom Jesus had perfect communion with, whom Jesus sought to and always did, perfectly please. Whose will Jesus always sought to do and did it, never his own, whom Jesus prayed to often, even just recently in the Garden of Gethsemane, he also turned his back on Jesus. There's a lot of theological sparring that goes on at this point in the text. I would suggest to you there was never a division of the Trinity, ever. But there was a break in the communion between the Father and the Son. The fellowship between the Father and the Son was temporarily set aside. But because of what happened on that cross, you know what that's, that does for the one who's trusted in Christ on this side of the cross, they can be assured that that separation which Jesus endured for you, you never have to endure if you trust Christ as your Savior. That will never, ever happen to you. Again, we go to verses like 1 John 2, 2, and teaches that God is, and that big fancy schmancy word is God is propitiated. There you go. He's propitiated. To which you ask, what does that mean? Propitiation simply means God is satisfied. Satisfied with us when we have Christ as our Savior covering our sin. Because we've trusted in the only one whom God is propitiated with, if you will. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gives us assurance that he will never leave us. And he will never forsake us. Hebrews 13.5 Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Folks, never means never. Never means never. So his ministry on the cross was indeed a very lonely one because, because of what took place on that cross. The one who places his trust in Christ will never experience being forsaken by God. 
But secondly, while his ministry on the cross was a lonely ministry, let me also suggest to you that Jesus' ministry on the cross was also a, a joint effort between the Father and the Son. Now it's tempting, and I hear it often, perhaps you've heard it, to recognize Jesus as the, the good guy and God is the bad guy, so to speak. Jesus is loving, but God's so harsh. Well, folks, uh, all you need to do is be reminded of the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved you that he gave you something. God is a loving God. The best known verse in the Bible seems to make that quite clear. God is perfectly holy and he is perfectly just and he will not compromise one for the sake of the other. When you look at a cross or if you take the time when you read scripture to meditate on the cross where Christ died, that event, that once in a universe event where the Son of God was nailed to a cross, that is where the holiness Love and justice of God are the clearest. And each one of those attributes, his holiness, his love, and his justice, are absolutely inflexible. They cannot, nor will they, be compromised. And this plan, this, this what took place on the cross, this wasn't like it was a, the second option or, or a plan B, if you will, nur was it a spur of the moment, throw it together at the last minute plan. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, makes that pretty clear, where Paul writes this, Ephesians chapter 1, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, verse 4, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So did you see it? See, Jesus wasn't caught off guard by a, 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 an ambiguous God who changed his mind at the last minute to surprise Jesus with something. From the foundation of the world, God the Eternal Son and God the Eternal Father were in loving, holy, just agreement with what would take place at the cross eventually. And I think it's quite appropriate that the laying on of sin on the only sinless one. I don't know about you, that statement boggles my mind. The laying on of sin on the only sinless one. My sin was laid on him on that cross 2,000 years ago. And yours. And sins for tomorrow, tomorrow's sins, were laid on him then. All sin laid on him. But I think it's very appropriate that when that took place, it occurred in the dark. Verse 45 of Matthew 27. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour is when Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That took place in the ninth hour at the point of the third hour of that three hours of darkness. Folks, there is no fellowship with God in the darkness. Now, I trust you understand that doesn't mean after the sun goes down. That means when sin is present, there is no fellowship with the God of heaven. 
Jesus Christ was wearing sin. Can you imagine? He was wearing sin. Fellowship was broke with him and the Father. Erwin Lutzer, the most recent retired pastor of Moody Bible Institute, or excuse me, of Moody Church, he puts it this way in his book, Christ from the Cross. Quote, In those three hours of darkness, Jesus became legally guilty of our sin. And for that, he was judged. Think of it. Legally guilty of genocide, child abuse, alcoholism, murder, adultery, homosexual activity, greed, and the like. How appropriate that when the, the sinless one who was made sin for us, that the event was veiled from human eyes. End of quote. His ministry on the cross was indeed one of loneliness. But his ministry on the cross was also a very specific planned joint effort between the Son and the Father. Third this morning, Jesus' ministry on the cross was one of forgiveness. Luke chapter 23 Beautiful verse you're probably very familiar with. Luke 23, verse 34. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, forgiveness sounds like a very reasonable and appropriate thing when we have it coming, right? But sometimes it's a little uncomfortable when I've done the wrong and I've got to ask it because it's an admission of guilt and that can be uncomfortable. But I believe when you forgive, you are acting more like Jesus in that act than at any other time. Now, that might sound a little offensive to those who recognize Jesus only as a God of love and Christianity as a religion of only goodness and benevolence. But the central, primary, non-negotiable message of Christianity is not love one's neighbor, though it's important. And it's not the high morality that you might find in the Sermon on the Mount, which is important. The message that changes lives for eternity is the cross. We are humanly guilty, helplessly guilty, and hopelessly guilty. And the closer we get to the cross, the truer that becomes. John Piper says this, the closer we get to the ugliness of the cross, the closer we are to the beauty of the cross. It's ugly because of me. It's beautiful because of God. End of quote. The cross, the primary theme of Christianity, because without it, without what took place on that cross, nothing else of Christianity is possible, because it can't do what it promises. It's forgiveness of sins that one needs. See, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good people. He came to make dead people alive. That's why he came. It's forgiveness of sin we need, and we need it from God to become his child. His ministry of forgiveness was available and effectual for those present and aware of and responsible for his crucifixion on that day. The words of Jesus in Luke 23, where he says, Father, Father, forgive them, for they do, know, do not know what they are doing. Folks, he's talking to somebody. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Father. He's praying. Do you believe God answers every one of Jesus' prayers? I believe every time Jesus prayed, the Father answered him. Every single time. 
So was everybody connected with the crucifixion forgiven at the moment he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Well, there was a centurion involved. And the centurion who was in charge of the crucifixion, he was forgiven. But only when he recognized the truth. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter preached the very first sermon in the very first moment of the very first church. And about 3,000 were saved after Peter preached Jesus to those who personally shared in the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. But 3,000 were saved after they heard the truth. In Acts 4, thousands more are saved when Peter preaches yet again. But you notice it? After he preached to them the truth. Then Acts chapter 6, Philip has an encounter out in the middle of nowhere. Or maybe that's chapter 7 in Acts. But Philip is out there and he comes across an Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian is reading a text in Isaiah, I believe it is. And Philip goes up to him and says, you know, what, you understand what you're reading? He says, well, not unless somebody explains it to me. And he explained it to him. And he trusted Christ right then and there. But he had to hear it to respond to it. And then in the early days, even weeks of the church, there were even some priests who were forgiven when they heard the truth and were drawn to Jesus Christ. So could God just forgive these people and wipe the slate clean? Could they receive forgiveness without asking to be forgiven? Folks, no. Jesus' prayer was not for the unrepentant. In other words, those who didn't want it. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, that was available to those who by faith would recognize they need a Savior, and God could at that moment save them. The prayer was for those who sought forgiveness. Jesus' ministry of forgiveness, his prayer of forgiveness, was offered up to those in the immediate and is available for those beyond the immediate, including this morning. Now, I was taught before I was born again that when Jesus was crucified, he saved everybody at that point. In fact, I heard somebody standing in one of these say that out loud to the crowd that was sitting there in which Lori and I were in the crowd. He said, thank you, God. You saved us all. Well, that's a nice thought. But it's out of the pit. You know that. It wasn't true of the multitudes who were saved after Peter preached. They had to believe the truth. It wasn't even true of both of the thieves nailed to crosses next to him. One of them decided, wow, this is true. I need what he has to offer. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Folks, he wasn't talking to both of them. He's talking to the one who was repentant that day. Wasn't true of that Ethiopian eunuch until he believed and responded. And it hasn't been true of anyone. See, salvation is 100% the work of God. But man's responsibility is to believe it. And place his trust in the truth once he's heard it. Where are you with that truth? The perfect Lamb of God who died for your sin. Folks, there were many who were alive the day Jesus was crucified. And they eventually died and entered a Christless eternity. But not because they could not be saved, but because they would not be saved. 
there's that debate out there in the theology world that he only died for the elect, and some people are destined to never believe. Ladies and gentlemen, the death on a cross is sufficient for any, is efficient for only those who come to him on his terms. Jesus was so unlike us in his humanity that even in the crucible of intense suffering, anguish, and loneliness, he was ministering on the cross for you. Do this with me. Raise your right hand. He died on the cross for me. He did. He died for you. You and your sin, me and my sin, belonged on that cross. But he and my sin went to that cross. You're loved by God. Your sin has been dealt with by God on the cross. Will you, by faith, come to him to receive the gift that he offers? Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin and eternal life. You cannot afford to put off trust in Christ. Each week, we often hear of somebody whose life is finished. I don't know what you do with that, but I often think, first thing I think is, were they ready? I just told my wife I think this morning, you know, I work a couple of overnights at the shelter in downtown Kansas City. And Friday morning around 3.30, I stepped outside to just do a couple of things. And in the not so far distance, I could hear gunshots. Folks, they weren't deer hunting. They were probably wallet hunting. Somebody didn't make it through the night. We can't afford put it off. If you're unsure, don't be foolish and wait because you need to know. And by the way, you can know whether you'll spend eternity with God or not. You can. It, you can absolutely know that for sure. And I would love to come talk to you. Or better, you even come talk to me. Or somehow we need to get together and talk about how you can know for sure your sins are forgiven. For those of us here, which could mean most of us, who at a moment in our life have placed our trust in Jesus Christ alone, how ought your life and my life reflect Jesus' sacrifice for you? The well-known atheist Nietzsche once said this, I might believe in the Christian Redeemer, if the Christians looked more like their Redeemer. It's fair, but not always. Because so often a statement like that is backloaded with a belief that simply says, as soon as a Christian messes up, I'm off the hook because they aren't perfect. Folks, there's only one that ever was perfect. Period. And it's him that we trust in. And so imperfect people trusting in a perfect Savior are a construction zone until the day they go home. But the result of the cross must be lived out in our lives. That's really not a good option to not do so, right? We need to live it out. And you know what that requires? Oh, what's that nasty word we don't like? Change. It's what it requires. It requires change. And for that Christian who maybe has long been rebellious, even change is, has to be precluded by repentance. And if God the Spirit is saying something to you about your life, the worst thing you can do is put that conviction out. When the conviction hits, we've got to respond to it when it hits. Because it only takes, and I, I'm open for discussion on this one, but it only takes seconds to step away from that conviction and say, oh boy, I really need to do that. 
and all of a sudden I'm involved in something else, and I forgot that convicting work. When the Spirit convicts, the person must respond. When that person responds to the work of the Spirit in their life, life begins to change. And if you're like me, you're still in a construction zone with a whole lot of spiritual orange cones still around you. Uh, the construction zone never ends. But the process is beautiful along the way. <laughs>